I'm going to tell you a real story about a four-year-old girl named Sandy. Not actually named Sandy, all the names of people and places have been changed for confidentiality. A girl, however, who, when she was free, suffered a great deal of trauma, to put it lightly, and then suffered the somewhat harmful care of the overworked, underfunded services meant to look after her until she finally got the help she needed through therapy, which... That's the bit we're going to focus this on, really. The help and the healing. You know, not too long ago, I made a video psychoanalyzing Jimmy Savile, and I said in that video it felt really uncomfortable to be focusing just on his perspective. I strongly believe it's important to try and understand such dark figures. We need to understand them if we want to prevent that kind of stuff. But it's the same as when you get all these billions of dramatic documentaries and videos about serial killers and that kind of stuff. and. At their worst, those documentaries kind of romanticise those people, and even at their best, the victims and the survivors in those stories tend to become nothing more than an object in their story, and then the audience end up viewing these real victims and survivors as nothing more than the killers themselves did as this kind of object, which is a really bizarre, uncomfortable situation. I think we do need more stories about the survivors, what it was like for them, what their journey was, how they made their way towards healing. Without those stories, they do remain somewhat silenced in our culture. Not, not that I'm championing some great crusade or anything here, this is literally just a therapy story from a book written by renowned psychiatrist Dr. Bruce Perry, but I guess I wanted to say that before we begin. Um, <laughs> to somewhat see someone else's experience of healing and also of how therapy can work, I think. It's still readily dismissed. Sometimes with good reason as well. You know, there'll be a lot of you I know out there who have had some bad experiences with particular therapists. But how can therapy be good? What can it look like? Particularly with a four-year-old child who is too young to easily talk. I think most people understand art therapy and play therapy are things, but how does it actually make a difference? How is it effective, you know? To put it very bluntly, how do you help a three-year-old who witnessed her mother's murder before having her own throat slit and being left to die? How is such an awful experience likely to affect a child and how can you recover from that? We'll approach this calmly and carefully and with total empathy. I know these kind of videos might be too much for some of you, that's obviously fine, this will be quite dark in places, but also ultimately life affirming, positive, hopeful and healing. So yes, I am a therapist myself, but let's get into discussing what is chapter 2 in the book titled The Boy Who Was Raised As A Dog and Other Stories From A Child Psychiatrist's Notebook. I need your help. The caller, Stan Walker, was an attorney for the Public Guardian's office. I had completed my training in child psychiatry and was now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago, still working at the clinic and running my lab. It was 1990. I just inherited a case scheduled to go to trial next week, he told me, explaining that it was a homicide. A three-year-old girl named Sandy had witnessed the murder of her own mother. Now, almost a year later, the prosecution wanted her to testify about it. I'm concerned that this might be pretty overwhelming for her, Stan went on, asking if I might be able to help prepare her for the court. Pretty overwhelming, I thought, sarcastically to myself. You think so? This is how Dr. Bruce Perry finds out about Sandy, through Stan Walker acting in a role where he is overloaded with an endless amount of case files, despite not actually having any training or experience with children specifically. I think we all know even today, public services like this are massively overworked and underfunded, which means, you know, often people don't have the time and resources and even sometimes proper training to get round to work in cases as efficiently and effective as they deserve. But also sometimes workers who are so stressed that they lose all the headspace to consider the bigger picture when it's needed or to communicate the extra subtle information to other workers when it's needed to do stuff that can mean sometimes things slip through the cracks, which 
is why in this situation it takes Dr. Perry looking in from the outside to point out the obvious things that Stan Walker here or others may not have stopped to realise. Because as the conversation goes on, things appear even worse. Sandy has not had any therapy at all since the murder. Also, the perpetrator was in a gang that have put out a contract on Sandy, meaning she is still in danger, which also means she is being bounced around from different undisclosed foster home to undisclosed foster home, not really getting proper time to form a connection with the foster parents or feel any stability, also none of the foster parents have been told anything at all about what she's been through, meaning all of her behaviour as a result of what she's been through just appears quite confusing to them. This quote though is quite blunt, I should say, but I think it's easier to begin by just explaining the bare bones facts of the situation before we get further into this story. So let me go over this again, I said. A three year old girl witnesses her mother being raped and murdered. She has her own throat cut twice and is left for dead. She is alone with her mother's body for 11 hours in their apartment, then she's taken to hospital and has her wounds on her neck treated. In the hospital, the physicians recommend ongoing mental health evaluation and treatment, but after she's released, she's placed into a foster home as a ward of the state. Her CPS caseworker doesn't think she needs to see a mental health professional, so despite the doctor's recommendations, he doesn't get her any help. For nine months, this child is moved from foster home to foster home with no counselling or psychiatric care whatsoever, and the details of the child's experience are never shared with the foster families because she is in hiding, right? Yeah, I guess all of that is true, he said, hearing the unmistakable frustration in my voice and how terrible it all sounded when I described it so bluntly. And now, ten days before a murder trial is scheduled to start, you become aware of the situation. It's not great. Um, the hope is, of course, that Sandy won't need to testify. They have other evidence that might be enough on its own. And they're hoping to have the trial postponed until they can know whether she is needed, and if so, hopefully get her testimony by a closed circuit TV instead of in court, or else give her time to prepare for it. Dr. Perry agrees to see Sandy the next day for an evaluation, which is what we come to next, although I think it is worth stepping away for a very brief explanation about trauma first. Trauma is ultimately what this entire book is about. It's something I'd like to someday make a kind of overview video on because there are so many misconceptions about trauma out there. But I'll try to keep this short and simple and relevant to the story. I promise there's a point to this information. So much of our understanding of trauma began first with research into war veterans where it was found their stress response systems were overreactive. What is called sensitized. Essentially meaning when placed in even minutely stressful experiences, their internal systems would respond to it like a massive life-endangering threat. The brain, essentially, when it doesn't always need to, goes full red alert, preparing you for extreme responses such as fights or flights, though not necessarily just then. There's also things like freeze, friend, flop. They'd be a good thing, actually, to devote a video to someday. Um, but yeah, there can be lots of things that might send you into this extreme response. The classic thing people talk about is triggers. You know, um, this book gives the example of brushing your teeth when an earthquake then happens. It's a traumatic experience, and then even a year down the line from then, brushing your teeth, even looking at a toothbrush, might conjure up a lot of anxiety and stress. You know rationally that there's no actual link between brushing your teeth and being in danger of an earthquake, but there's this more unconscious connection in your brain. It's not always as straightforward as that, it's not always clear triggers either, sometimes it's just stress in general, um, but the point is, we all have this stress response system for a reason, when we are in genuine danger it can save our lives. We need it, however, if we experience something too overwhelming it can leave our stress response system panicked, let's say. When people talk about having trauma, it's not really the traumatic event itself that they mean, it's their body's response to the traumatic event that they're talking about. A response that keeps coming back in situations, months, years, maybe even decades after the event. And still, a prevailing misconception is that children are somehow less affected by traumatic experiences. 
Personally, I think that's an idea that comes out of our culture's eagerness to idealise children as these innocent, pure beings are hope for the future, you know? We don't want to think about that hope being uh, tarnished, I guess is the word. No, that's definitely not the word, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> children are more likely to be affected by traumatic events because their brains are still in that flexible, malleable stage where it's forming thousands of connections. They're more sensitive to the experiences at that age. They are quite literally the experiences the brain is learning from the most, goods or bad experiences. Ideally, we encounter things that are stressful as a child, like, I, I don't know, falling over in a playground, a dog barking at you, and we have support around us, a nice mix of comfort, empathy, encouragement, and trust that we can manage these experiences. The child learns it's okay, it wasn't nice, it's still not nice, but it's manageable. And then they have these kind of experiences repeated enough times, falling over, hearing dogs bark at you, and slowly the brain starts to tolerate it. It kind of tunes it out in a way. The brain's starting to learn this is a normal thing, I don't need to set off the internal alarms every time this happens. And then you slowly experience more stressful things and manage them and it kind of builds up in a way. Like going to the gym, you start with the lighter weights that you can manage and if you repeat that weight and consistent repetitions enough times, your muscles learn to tolerate it and then you up the weights. Whereas like if you went straight into the gym with a far too heavy weight to begin with, your muscles, <laughs> they won't learn to adjust to it, will they? They'll just, it will just cause a tear and you'll hurt yourself and it'll make it a lot harder to lift anything at all. So in the same way, an experience too overwhelming for whatever reason that any of us could encounter at any point in our lives, metaphorically then that causes the same sort of tear on your brain, muscles, yeah, I, I think this analogy still holds, um, and it has nothing to do with how strong or weak you are, and everything instead to do with experiences earlier in your life, and how much support you got then, and how much support you get now. Sometimes we can mostly recover from a traumatic experience quite quickly, especially if we have a good support network around us, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes it can take far, far longer and require much more support. Which is another misconception, really. Trauma, you're not forever cursed by it. Whilst the brain forms the most connections in early life, meaning uh, those early experiences do have the biggest impact, it doesn't mean the brain stops forming connections in later life. It's never too late in that way, it never stops and we can learn from good experiences later on. Here's me chucking in a quick diagram of Dan Siegel's The Window of Tolerance. It's not the only way, but it's one way of looking at it simply. You know, our stress levels can naturally go up and down all the time in life. Things happen. <laughs> um, and when our stress goes out of this window, we become either hyper or hypo aroused. Which is where all of the fight, flight, phrase, friend, flop stuff comes in. Some people's windows will be wider than others, but most important of all, the window can grow. That's what a lot of therapy can be focused on, helping your window widen a little at a time. Why is this relevant to the story? Uh, well, naturally, Dr. Perry tries to get some background on Sandy before he meets her, and he discovers this. Sandy had profound sleep problems and was pervasively anxious. I was told she had an increased startle response, she would jump at the slightest unexpected noise. She also had episodic periods of daydreaming, during which it was extremely difficult to get her to snap out of it. A doctor who saw her without knowing her history might have diagnosed her with the absence or petit mal form of epilepsy. She was that hard to reach during these episodes. I also learned that Sandy sometimes had aggressive, tantrum-like outbursts. Her foster family couldn't pinpoint what set them off, but they did report another set of odd behaviours. Sandy didn't want to use silverware. Unsurprisingly, she was especially afraid of knives, but she also refused to drink milk or even look at milk bottles. When the doorbell rang, she would hide like a skittish cat, sometimes so effectively that it took 20 minutes for the foster parents to find her. She could also be found on occasion hiding underneath a bed, behind a couch, in a cabinet under the kitchen sink, rocking and crying. Aggressive outbursts 
running and hiding and dissociative episodes of apparent daydreaming that they can't snap her out of. All very typical effects of trauma that make sense when you see it as the body responding to what it thinks is extreme stress, even if you might rationally know it's all okay. Even today, this kind of behaviour is stuff misunderstood that can lead to teachers and parents and prison guards responding to people in ways that are harmful and just make things worse for everybody. So often school children are accused of being defiant when they might just be freezing up or becoming hyper aroused. And like I know someone who has worked in prisons who says she hears people telling the prisoners all the time, you just keep making the wrong choices, you've got to learn to make the right choices, etc etc. When it's like, this might go beyond rational decision making. We're somehow expecting them to handle something on their own when they might need support to do so, and then blaming them when they fail. That's just me venting my own frustration though, I won't go too far with that. Um, as for the refusal to use cutlery and drink milk and running when she hears the doorbell, this is stuff that absolutely would have made sense if things had even been remotely explained to the foster parents. Well the milk one might not be obvious, uh, yet, but you'll see why that is the case in a second. Let's get to actually meeting Sandy. When I walked in, Sandy was sitting on the floor with some dolls around her. She was colouring. What first struck me was how small she was. She had huge liquid brown eyes and long, thick, curly brown hair. On her neck were visible scars on both sides, from ears to the middle of her throat, but they were less noticeable than I'd imagined they might be. The plastic surgeons had done a good job. As I walked in with Stan, she stopped everything, stared at me, frozen. Stan introduced me. Sandy, this is the doctor I told you about. He is going to talk with you, okay? He asked anxiously. She didn't move, not one millimetre. There was no change in her wary expression. In his best, cheerful, kindergarten voice, Stan said, Okay, good. Well, I will leave you two together. Not the best way to make someone so clearly on edge feel safe, but I think it's also typical. Um, when you can, it's definitely good to ask the child's permission. As it is here, Sandy is too frozen to respond, and Stan has things to get on with, so he just leaves, and Bruce Perry makes the most of this situation by pulling a face of surprise at Stan, then shaking his head with a little shrug and a smile at Sandy as if to say, huh, that was a bit odd, kind of thing. And then in the total mirror, Sandy responds with this exact same shake, shrug, and smile. Aha! A connection! This was a good start, I thought. Don't let it slip away. I knew if I walked towards this tiny girl, her sensitised alarm response would go crazy. Her surroundings were already unfamiliar enough. New adults, new place, new situation. I want to colour some too, I said, without looking at her. I wanted to be as predictable as possible, and let her know what I was going to do step by step. No sudden moves. Make yourself smaller, I thought. Get on the floor. Don't look at her. Don't face her. Use slow, deliberate movements as you colour. I sat down on the floor, a few feet away. I really like red. This should be a red car, I said, pointing at a picture in my colouring book. I don't think I'd have quite done it like that. I would probably have told her my name and asked if she minded me sitting down to do some colouring too, but it's a good start. You don't want to avoid looking at her too much, I don't think, but knowing you're a doctor who's come in to see her, staring can be very intense. Anyway, for a long time he does nothing but colour on his own and talk out loud about his choices of colours and things without expecting her to respond. You know, sometimes they don't feel ready to, sometimes they don't even want to respond. That's fine. As the book puts it, he's trying to be as casual and friendly as he can without being overly bright. I tend to think people can sometimes be a little too eager to build a rapport with children. They can come in full energy and friendly and jokey and stuff because they're very keen for the kid to know that I'm alright, I'm not a threat, you can be close to me kind of thing. But sometimes it's better to give the kid the space to make up their own mind at their own pace. He sat a little away from her, he's talking but not expecting anything from her while she just sits and studies him and then eventually edges a little nearer, and then directs him about a colour to use and he complies and then they both colour quietly. I had yet to ask her about what had happened, but I could sense she knew why I was there, and that she knew that I knew she knew. All of the adults in her new life had sooner or later, in some way, returned her to that night. What's happened to your neck? I asked, 
pointing to her two scars. She acted as if she did not hear me. She did not change her expression. She did not change her pace of colouring. I repeated the question. Now she froze. Colouring stopped. Her eyes stared off into space, unblinking. I asked again. She took a crayon and scribbled over her well-formed, disciplined picture but gave no response. In many ways, I think aggressively scribbling over the picture is a response. She's using art there to show exactly what happened. This is what play therapy and art therapy can be great for, expressing when direct conversation is too much. But I also need to stress what's happening here is not at all therapeutic. Not at all. It's a very blunt question, especially on a first meeting. You know, I've just talked about lifting heavy weights causing tears, and here's him jumping in straight away with the heavy questions that are, of course, massively overwhelming and could be really harmful here. How are you supposed to trust your therapist is safe to talk to when they shoot stuff like that at you from the off, you know? But this is early into his career, I suppose. This is the 90s, and this isn't therapy yet. This is an evaluation to see how able Sandy is to answer all the direct questions needed in court. To be honest, I don't even know if this is how these kind of evaluations are done or not, or if there are better ways to do it. It's not my area of expertise. I kind of have thoughts, but I might be wrong, so I'm not going to voice them. Let's move on to the important bits. Again, I asked. I hated this. I knew I was pushing her towards her painful memories. Sandy stood up, grabbed a stuffed rabbit, held it by the ears and slashed at the neck of the animal with the crayon. As she slashed, she repeated, It's for your own good, dude. Over and over. A stuck recording. She threw the animal to the floor, ran to the radiator and climbed up and jumped off again and again. She did not respond to my warnings to be careful. Worried that she would hurt herself, I rose and caught her in one of the jumps. She melted into my arms. We sat together for a few more minutes. The frenzied breathing slowed, and then almost stopped. And then, in slow, robotic monotone, she told me about that night. I don't think I really need to comment here, I'm just stepping it back in case any of you need a depriver, really. This play bit here is where she's showing her emotions and is somewhat trying to express it, possibly work through it, albeit a bit too much here, this is too much, you can see that. Um, obviously you can't let her get hurt, but therapists often do have to find a balance in these sort of situations between keeping them safe and letting them explore ways to express things. For example, I once counselled a child who wanted in a session to put tape over his mouth and to tape up his wrists and then afterwards to do the same thing to me. The exact sort of thing that, on the one hand, is a safeguarding nightmare, you know, if a teacher or parent heard about that kind of thing happening in the session, they would be rightly very concerned. On the other hand, a lot of important feelings can be expressed through allowing that kind of play, things they might not otherwise be able to talk about directly. You need boundaries to keep them safe, but you also need the freedom for them to explore, sometimes explore things that are difficult and dark and sad and scary, sometimes even to just explore the stuff that gets labelled as bad behaviour. But here, Bruce Perry needs for the evaluation's sake to see how able she is to explain this stuff, so here's what Sandy tells him. An acquaintance of her mother had come to their apartment. He had rung the doorbell, and the mother had let him in. Mama was yelling. The bad guy was hurting her, she said. I should have killed him. When I came out of my room, Mama was asleep. Then he cut me, she continued. He said, it's for your own good, dude. The assailant had cut her throat twice. Later, Sandy regained consciousness and attempted to wake up her mother. She took milk from the fridge and gags when she tried to drink some. It oozed through the slit in her throat. She tried to give some to her mother, but she was not thirsty, Sandy told me. Sandy wandered that apartment for 11 hours before anyone came. A relative, worried that Sandy's mother had not answered the phone, had dropped by and discovered the horrifying crime scene. It's awful. It's not easy to hear, but I said this video was focused on healing. I said it was going to be life-affirming, and we've barely even discussed that yet, so we're going to come to that now. Bruce was left certain that Sandy was in no fit state to testify. If she absolutely had to, then she needed help and she needed more time to prepare. Stan was able to postpone the trial and asked Bruce if he would be happy to see her for therapy, which he agreed to. 
So as I've said, these type of hyper or hypo arouse responses are important. They are there to keep us safe and they do all sorts of wonderful things. It's partly why I criticise Dr. Phil from time to time for all of this stripping away people's defences stuff. You know, people need those defences to feel they can survive. You don't strip them away, you help them reach a place where they feel they don't need them anywhere near as much or as intensely. Fights or flights are the obvious bodily responses to danger, but what about situations where neither of those things work, such as Sandy would have been in? Because if her body went into fight or flight modes, it would have been raising her heart rate to prepare her for action, really, which would have made her much more likely to bleed to death when she was injured. Instead, dissociation was her response. Very much like an animal curling up in the wild, blood is shunted away from the limbs and the heart rate slows to reduce blood loss from wounds. Even more so, as the book puts it, a flood of endogenous opioids, the brain's natural heroin-like substances, is released killing pain and producing calm and a sense of psychological distance from what is happening. None of this happens rationally. Sandy doesn't decide this in any way. The body just does it. These defences take over because they need to. There's this cool video about an opossum that quite literally plays dead to the extent of losing consciousness. Just as the second coyote senses that a meal is at hand, her mate appears to have lost his appetite. Most predators need the stimulation of resistance to incite them to kill, and the act of killing to induce them to eat. An inert body inspires little interest, but the possum is still breathing, and in fact, it's only playing dead, biding time until the threat of danger is past. It's Kind of incredible, really. The first time I met Sandy for therapy, it was in the foyer of a church. Still in the form of witness protection, she had to be protected from the killer's fellow gang members who could not be arrested because they hadn't directly taken part in the crime. So we met in unusual places at atypical times. Obviously, this is not ideal. Having some semblance of routine and familiarity, knowing where you're going and when, is of course going to help her feel less alert. This is about her safety, really, in a practical sense. Anyway, Bruce greets her and then gets to colouring on the floor. After a moment, Sandy comes over to join him and then the foster mother leaves them both there. Bruce is going to be a lot less forward this time and let her take the lead, which I think is what therapists tend to do for children in a lot of circumstances, really. The kids know why they're there, or should do if it's been explained. They know what's on their mind, they know what their feelings are. Let them take the lead and have the control to explore those feelings. They're in the driver's seat, you're the passenger going along with them. And she's actually very keen to do this from the off. For ten minutes, our play was just like the initial visit in the court. Then it changed. Sandy stopped colouring. She took the crown from my hand, pulled at my arm and tugged at my shoulder to make me lay down face on the floor. What game is this? I asked playfully. No, don't talk, she said. She was deadly serious and forceful. She had me bend my knees and put my arms behind my back, as if I was hogtied. And then the reenactment took place. For the next 40 minutes, she wandered the classroom, muttering things, only some of which I heard. Acting out past experiences can be so much more beneficial than just talking about them. Not always, obviously, but talking can be much more difficult for children in particular, and in acting it out there's some dynamic, there's some interaction going on between the therapist and the clients. They get to more directly feel things, because yes, this is just a game, it's safe, Sandy knows it's safe, that's a big part of why she feels able to act any of this out at all. But even then, this will feel extremely moving for the therapist. A lot of emotions will be being transferred here. Bruce is in some ways made to feel as Sandy's mum felt, or as Sandy imagines her mum feeling. And Sandy gets to try and make sense of how her attacker felt in the moment, or how she felt witnessing this happen. To explore and process everything that happened in a space that feels safe to do so, where you know you can shut it down if it all gets too much. This is good. You can eat this, she said, coming over to me with a plastic vegetable and opening my mouth to try and feed me. Then she brought the blanket over to cover me. During that initial therapy session, she would approach me, lay on me, shake me, open my mouth and my eyes, and then leave again to find something in the room 
almost always returning with another toy or another object. She did not reenact her own assault, and for the rest of the time I worked with her, she never did fully reenact it, but she frequently said, For your own good, dude, as she walked around. While she did this, I had to do exactly what she wanted. Don't talk, don't move, don't interfere, don't stop. She needed to have total control while she performed this reenactment, and that control, I began to recognise, would be critical to helping her heal. After all, what's the main defining feeling of Sandy's experience? Being utterly helpless and powerless and out of control. If we can then return to an environment where we can feel safe and things can feel more predictable, not uncertain, where we can feel aware and prepared and we can gradually start to feel more in control again, not just of our lives, but of this experience itself. That's what acting it out helps her to do. It's not the only thing enactment does and, you know, regaining a sense of control isn't the only important point, but it's what the whole point of this chapter in the book is and <laughs> therefore it's the focus of this video. Rather than the experience being something altogether overwhelming, it's something she is now taking charge of. I decide how I think about it, how I express and explore it. I decide when we stop, as she sometimes does, when the enactment becomes too much, she shuts it off and goes back to doing something else. Plus, she knows it's seeing the therapist in these spaces away from the rest of her life where she does this exploring. When the sessions end, she feels safe to step away from it again and go back into her ordinary life. Bruce lets her be in control here. Obviously, there's going to be some boundaries needed to keep her safe, but generally. Sometimes you do need to take a more active role, definitely, but here, Sandy intrinsically seems to know what she needs to do to move forwards, and she is working at this wonderfully here. And like I said about the analogy of working out at a gym and repeating the same exercises over and over until the muscles tolerate that experience much better, something uh, kind of like that is happening here. Exploring this play over and over until its impact on you lessens, until she feels safer around it, far more in control and less overwhelmed. Just to jump in as well, having the therapist here with her through all of this of course makes a massive difference compared to Sandy just for example playing all of this stuff at home on her own. Because even though Bruce isn't technically doing anything here, he is still right there with her, taking on, holding, feeling all this vast, terrifyingly painful array of emotions being thrown up here. He is holding all of that in mind without becoming overwhelmed himself, Sandy then seeing and experience him not becoming overwhelmed by her feelings will help her learn and encourage her to also get better at exploring and holding them in mind without becoming overwhelmed. Whilst he's not actively doing anything at all here, he is a constant guide in everything, heart breaking as this may be, he stays with her in these feelings. Again, it's not the only thing that's important for her healing, if you've watched my series you'll know there's a wide variety of support needed but we're sticking to the focus of this chapter today. Doing this more gradually Sandy's play does start to change. Change she's instigating by the way which makes it twice as powerful. At first there are the occasional times where while Bruce lies hogtied and silent Sandy would sit on his back and even quietly hum or rock. And then after 12 sessions she wants him to lie on his side instead. And then she'd lie down on me, rocking, humming fragments of tunes, sometimes stopping as if frozen. Sometimes she would cry. Little by little she did less muttering and exploring and spent more time rocking and humming. Finally, after many months of having me lie on the floor, as I started to walk to the middle of the room to lay down, she took my hand and led me to a rocking chair instead. She had me sit. She walked over to the bookcase, pulled down a book, and crawled into my lap. Read me a story, she said. And as I started, she said, Rock! Thereafter, Sandy sat in my lap, and we rocked and read books. <laughs> um, does this heal everything? No, the book doesn't claim it does, but it's a damn good beginning, especially after however many months this is. She has explored and worked through that experience there in a way that's safe, and done it well enough to begin to alter that play into something more healing. 
She worked through and earned that change in her own story, first at an emotional distance, then closer to Bruce, then open enough to allow herself to cry, and then eventually to be comforted. It's wonderful. The therapy does continue beyond this point, there are other things too. Her foster parents are given understanding and support so they can help Sandy better. Sandy is also prescribed clonidine, which, you know, now is not the day for the great medication debate. It certainly can be helpful, and it seems to be that in this example. Sandy still has a long way to go, but the chapter ends with this. I'm pleased to say that ultimately, Sandy did alright. Sometimes she struggled, but mostly did amazingly well. She made friends, got good grades, and was notably kind and nurturing in her interactions with others. As I write this, I am pleased to say I received an update two months ago. She is doing well. Because of the circumstances of the case, I cannot reveal any further details. Suffice to say, she's having the kind of satisfying and productive life we had all wanted for her. Nothing could make me happier. It is wonderful. I hope this feels like a hopeful story, even if it is very, very moving and very dark, all of the things she has to explore. It's not easy for her, not at all, and The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog is a wonderful book that I obviously recommend. I'm keen to do videos on other chapters from it at some point. As I say, this is only chapter two. Um, I hope that's something you're all interested in. Naturally, I'm going to continue my other content too, such as analysing characters from books and films or video essays and the Katie series, which is still ongoing. Um, we have to check the unlisted playlist for updates on it. Really, I'm hoping to find some way to market this video that it does do well in views, that the title attracts more people to this kind of content, because in a way this stuff seems niche, I know it does, but it's also going to be the best content and the most meaningful and important kind of content I can provide on my channel. Here again, Bruce Perry is a better therapist than me. Of course his stories will be more valuable as a video than me doing my own things. Um, there's always going to be important things to learn in this kind of stuff, and to also reignite people's hope, if that's not too dramatic. You know, we all have it burning low at times, but healing can happen. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm getting completely rambling now. Uh, but if you like this, please comment, please like the video, try and help it do as well in the algorithm as it can. Subscribe if you want more stuff, or support me on Patreon, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Blue Core, Treat You Caber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Flying Spider, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Folliette, and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.